Shalom to everyone who has come to this video. In part one, I already went over the fact that when you see Holy Spirit in the Bible, it's some form of the words Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew. Now, as most of us know, the so-called New Testament is in Greek. So it would be the words Hagios Numa as far as Greek is concerned. As you see on the screen, the word hagios, it just means holy. Strong's definition says an awful thing, sacred, physically pure, morally blameless or religious, ceremonially consecrated, most holy, one thing, saint. So again, it just means holy. Um, the word pneuma, which again is the word for spirit in the Greek. It says in the, under the definition, a current of air, i.e. breath, blast, or a breeze by analogy or figuratively a spirit, i.e. human, the rational soul, by implication, vital principle, mental disposition, etc. So you see it's clear that spirit can refer to various things. It says, or superhuman, an angel, demon or divine God, Christ spirit, the Holy Spirit, ghosts, life, spirit, mind. So again, spirit means various things in the scriptures. Some will tell you that when you see the term Holy Ghost, capitalized in the so-called New Testament. They'll tell you that this is supposed to convey to you that it's referring to the third person of the Trinity who is a part of the Godhead. However, Greek minuscules or what we would today call lowercase letters did not exist at the time of the so-called New Testament being written. So it was later translators, many of whom were believers in the Trinity, who decided to capitalize the term Holy Ghost, which is why you see it capitalized in your Bibles. So don't let the fact that you see it capitalized confuse you. Again, the term spirit or Holy Spirit does not always refer to the same exact thing. Neither is it some incomprehensible entity that is a part of a trinity. Holiness essentially comes from the Father because he is, as the scriptures say, the Father of spirits and he is holy. So the Father is a Holy Spirit. Mashiach or Christ is a Holy Spirit as well. The angels are also Holy Spirits. And as we're about to discuss in this video, the word of the Most High is spiritual and it is spirit and it is holy as well. Again, spirit refers to different things in different contexts, but ultimately nothing can be holy without the Father. Please see my video on how the word of Yah comes down to man for the foundation of what I'm about to explain to you here and now. So just to be clear, there are variations on the term pneuma, different forms of the word that I use to describe something being spirit or spiritual. You also have phantasma, which means spirit in the Greek. For those who speak Spanish, you already know that fan phantasma means ghost in Spanish. So as you see on the screen, there are variations uh, to the word spirit, but typically it will be pneuma or some form of the word. And the same thing goes with holy. We already went over hagios or hagos. It will be some form typically of that word when speaking about something being holy. You also have heroes and etc. that you see on the screen here. This is John chapter six, 
verse 63, and this is Mashiach speaking. He says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. And to quicken means to give you life. In this context, he's talking about eternal life. He says, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So the words that he's speaking is what he's referring to when he says the spirit is what gives you life. And again, he's referring to eternal life and the ability to do what the most high would have you do. Verse 64 says, but there are some of you that believe not for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So to reject the spirit in this context, again, he's talking about the word of the most high, which is what he's speaking to reject the spirit is to reject the words of Christ. And you can also say the scriptures in general, that's to reject the spirit. To receive the spirit is to receive and believe the word in this context. If we go to John chapter 14, verse 10, it says, this is Christ again speaking. He says, believest thou not that I am in the father and the father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. So Mashiach isn't speaking of himself. He's speaking what the father sent him to speak about. He says, but the father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Here in John chapter 12, verse 49, he says, for I have not spoken of myself, but the father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. So again, to reject his words is to reject the spirit because he is speaking what the father told him to speak. So you're rejecting the words of the most high when you reject the words of Mashiach. As it says in John six, as the living father hath sent me and I live by the father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me and to eat him refers to eating the word or receiving his word, receiving what he said, what he taught, and believing it. That's what he's referring to when he says to eat my body and to drink my blood. You're receiving and believing what Christ taught and what he did as the scriptures explain. As it says here in John six thirty five, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So again, it goes back to believing on him. When you believe the truth and receive the truth of Christ and his word, his death, burial, and resurrection, you are receiving Christ and you're receiving the truth. And again, that's spiritual. The word is spiritual. If you've watched my previous video on how the word of Yah comes down to mankind, you understand that he uses angels to take his word to mankind. You understand the protocol that the word goes from the father to the son, to the angel and to mankind. Now, when you see people prophesying in the scriptures, what they're doing is they're speaking the words of the most high that have been put into their mind and who put it into their mind, the same protocol. It went from the father to the son, to the angel, and it was put in their minds to speak. That's what people are doing when they're prophesying.
often they don't even know what they're even talking about. And again, when it comes to understanding when the Bible says spirit of God, spirit of the Lord, etc., Holy Spirit, once you get it out of your mind or remove the thought that it's always talking about the exact same thing, then you can begin to understand what it's talking about um, in context. And as you learn the scriptures, again, all holiness comes from the most high. He is the ultimate spirit. The father is a spirit and everything that he does is spiritual. So here in first Samuel 19, starting at verse 20, it says, and Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul and they also prophesied. So for those of us who are familiar, we know that Saul was trying to kill David. And so as he says here, he sent messengers to take David, but the spirit of God, which is an angel, came upon the messengers of Saul and they prophesied. And so in verse 21, it says, and it was told Saul, he sent other messengers and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again the third time and they prophesied also. So the spirit of the most high, the angel of the most high is resting on these messengers and putting the word of the most high into their minds. And we're going to look a little bit more at that in this video. And so they're prophesying what they're being compelled to speak from the words that are being put into their mind. And in verse 22, it says, then when went he also to Ramah and came to a great well that is in Seku. And he asked and said, where are Samuel and David? And one said, behold, they be at Nioth in Ramah. And he went thither to Nioth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Nioth in Ramah. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore they say is Saul among the prophets, also among the prophets. So the same thing happened to Saul when he went himself to seek David. Here in Numbers chapter 11, starting at verse 24, it says, And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people, and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. So it's the same thing happening again. The spirit rests upon them and the spirit puts the words of prophecy from the most high into their minds and compels them to speak. It says in verse 26, but there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad and the spirit rested upon them and they were of them that were written, but went not out into the tabernacle and they prophesied in the camp. So again, the spirit of the most high, again, is compelling them to prophesy. Revelation chapter 10, starting at verse nine, it says, and I went unto the angel. And this is of course the apostle John speaking. It says, and said unto him, give me the little book. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey so the little book refers to the word of the most high and again the apostle john is getting it from who the angel 
That's who he gets the word from. In verse 10, it says, And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many people, nations, tongues, and kings. So again, that word is what causes you to prophesy. The angel puts it into your mind. And from there, you're able to prophesy. As it says here in verse 11, he's going to prophesy before many people, nations, tongues, which means languages and kings. And how do you prophesy to different languages of people? By being able to speak different languages, which is what the gift of tongues is for. But we're going to touch on that in a second. As it says here in Ezekiel chapter three, verse one through three, moreover, he said unto me, son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So again, as I've already explained, if you watch my video on how the word comes down to mankind, and if you've also seen my part one of the Holy Spirit series, then you understand that there's many times in the Bible where it says that the Lord is speaking or that God is speaking. But when you really break it down, you will see that it was an angel speaking because he is the representative of the Most High. The Most High speaks through him, in other words. Again, I've, ex I've went over this in detail. Please watch those videos if you haven't. And so here, the angel is again telling Ezekiel, just like we just read in John or in Revelation chapter 10, about the apostle John it's telling him to eat the word and in verse 2 it says so I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll and we know that the roll or the scroll is what the word of the most high is written on in ancient times it says and he said unto me son of man cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. So again, as it says in verse 1, he ate this roll or this word so that he can speak to the house of Israel, speak the words of the Most High. The word is put in his mind so that he can speak it to others. Again, in Revelation 10, we saw that John got the word from the angel. He ate the word and he was told that he must prophesy before many people, nations, languages, and kings. And so when we go to Acts chapter two, starting at verse one, it says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a Russian mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. So what is this sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind? When you hear a sound like that, typically you understand that something or someone is moving or has moved past you at a high rate of speed, which is why you hear that wind sound. As it says here in John chapter three, verse eight, the wind bloweth where it listeth or wherever it wants. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So you hear the wind, but you don't know where it came from or where it's going. It says, so is everyone that is born of the spirit. That's the case for everyone that is a spirit. When you are a spirit, 
you can't be seen by the naked eye. As it says here in Job 9.11, Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. This is Job talking about the Most High, who again is a spirit. He doesn't perceive or see this spirit. So that's what it's referring to in Acts chapter 2. And verse 2 is speaking about the spirit that came from heaven, which we know is an angel. And then in verse 3, it says, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. So this is a spiritual representation. Cloven meaning split in two which refers to the fact that they can speak more than one language now. So they're being given this gift, this ability by this angel. And in verse four, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, same thing, and began to speak with other languages or tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they're all being filled with the Holy Spirit, with the word of the Most High that the angel is putting into their minds, just like we read what happened to Saul when he was seeking David, just like we read about what happened in the time of Moses when they started prophesying. It's because the spirit or the angel gave them the words, put it in their minds to do so. And they are compelled to speak the words of the Most High. And in this case, they're speaking it in different languages. And that also goes back again to what happened with John. He was told that he must speak to different languages once he ate that word that the angel gave to him. And going to verse 6, it says, Now, or verse 5, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So that's the purpose of this. It's a sign and a message to the Israelites who are scattered and who were in this area at this time. That's That was the point because they speak different languages. So this is a sign to them. It says in verse seven, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Again, that's the purpose of this. They can hear it in different languages. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our own tongues or our own languages, the wonderful works of God and the wonderful works of Elohim are the word of the most high. When we go to Psalm 105, for example, in verse one through two, it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wonderful works. So the wonderful works are spoken about in the psalms, the wonderful works of the Most High. So that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the wonderful works of the Most High 
Again, watch my video on how the word of Yah comes down to mankind for more details. But as it says here in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Which means that this revelation was given to Christ, as it says here in verse 1, from the Father. And Christ gave it to the angel to give it to John. That's the protocol. So when the Father gives us as mankind his word, he doesn't sprinkle no dust and it falls down onto us. He doesn't get off of his throne because he is a spirit and come down and give it to us personally. He is the king and he has delegates that do his work for him. And there's a chain of command. And we just saw the chain of command. It's the father to the son, to the angel, to mankind. That's what happens when we receive the word of the most high, whether it be to prophesy, whether it be the prophets of old, having scriptures being written, etc. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says in verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, or the new covenant, which is the same thing. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. So why does the letter kill? The letter kills because it's going to reveal your flaws and your sin. In verse 7 it says, but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the spirit rather be glorious? So he's referring to after Moses came down from the mount and his face was shining. He was referring to that countenance that Moses had at that time, which obviously faded away. But it says here in verse 8, How shall not the ministration of the Spirit rather be glorious? Talking about the Spirit of the Word. So why is he saying that the commandments were a ministration of death? Let's go to Romans 7. Romans chapter 7 verse 6 it says but now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were healed that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter so we're supposed to walk in the spirit of the word it says in verse 7 so what shall we say then is the law sin God forbid nay I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So he's making clear that the problem is not with the law. In verse 8, he says, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrote in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. And verse 9 says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the law or when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. So in other words, what Paul is saying is that and that's the same reason why he said the ministration of death written and engraven in stones, talking about the law. The reason it's the ministration of death 
is because as he says here in the commandment which was ordained to life i found to be unto death why is that he's going to explain he says for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good so he's making clear that the law is holy the commandment is holy it's just it's righteous he says was that then which is good made death unto me god forbid but sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful for we know that the law is spiritual so again the word is spirit but i am carnal sold under sin in other words the commandments the law the ministration of death written and engraven in stones will reveal that you are a sinner it will reveal that you are wicked it will reveal that you may deserve to be put to death it will reveal that you deserve to go to the lake of fire that's why he calls it the ministration of death but again the law is spiritual but as mankind we are carnal so that's what we're supposed to be focused on walking in the spirit of the word the purpose of the law i've been over in other videos how in ancient times just like today people would take the word and they would twist it to their own destruction which is why christ had so many back and forths with the pharisees because they took the law and they used it in a manner that was unrighteous they didn't walk in the spirit of the law and what's the spirit of the law what the law is teaching you ultimately love your neighbor as yourself love the most high it's what it boils down to and as it says here in first peter chapter one starting at verse nine it says receiving the end of your faith or the purpose of your faith the goal of your faith even the salvation of your souls of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you so the prophets inquired and they searched diligently and they prophesied of the grace that will come to us who are under the blood of christ it says searching what or what manner of time the spirit of christ which was in them so the prophets had the spirit of christ in them he was here all the way from the beginning it says or what manner of time the spirit of christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of christ and the glory that should follow so the prophets through the spirit of christ testify beforehand christ's sufferings and the glory that should follow and much of that glory we have not even seen yet uh, with our own eyes but it will come to pass and it says in verse 12 unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now and talking about the prophets they ministered unto us for the things that are to come to pass it says it says but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the holy ghost sent down from heaven or the holy word sent from heaven speaking about the sufferings as it said of christ 
and the glory that is to come. And much of that glory we haven't even seen yet. But the prophets and the apostles taught about that. It says, which things the angels desire to look, look into. And we know that angels don't know everything. So even they are interested and they desire to look into the things that will come to pass and the things that have already happened regarding Christ, which is prophesied in his word. <laughs> 